50th birthday to the fundraising school, what that means for fundraising today. Hi, I'm Bill Stajakiewicz. This is the first day from the fundraising school, and I'm honored to welcome to our podcast one of my very first instructors in professional ethical fundraising, Lilia Wagner, longtime faculty member with the fundraising school and administrator within the Center on Philanthropy, now the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And Lilia, what a delight to have you back on the podcast with the fundraising school. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially since I have long memories of the fundraising school. In fact, my memory started when I was quite green in the fundraising profession and I was heading into a very difficult situation, going back to college where I had been a teacher. And when I went back as vice president for advancement, that always brought a lot of comment, the advancement part. And uh, I had to raise a lot of money for debt reduction. So one of the first weeks of my new job, I went to the fundraising school when Hank Grasso was still running it. So I go quite a ways back with the fundraising school, thank goodness. Do you remember some of those first lessons? And you know, Hank used to you had to end a course by telling him what stood out the most and you know, those types of things. What are some of your recollections, your early memories from when you were taking those courses uh, back in the 1970s with the fundraising school? Actually, that was in the 1980s. Oh, okay. So in the 1980s with the fundraising school, what what do you remember? Well, one of the things that I remember and that has been very interesting for me, we used to talk about, are we a profession or are we technicians? And in those days following, especially as I came to the fundraising school in 1991, It was one of the topics of conversation. We would discuss what makes a profession and how do we get that kind of respect as a profession deserves, because you know all the jokes about fundraisers and all the criticism we sometimes draw and yet all the good things that we accomplish. So that's been one of the things that the discussion started there under Hank And we have continued it, and I'm happy to say I think we have arrived, especially as we see so many places of learning, so many centers that have come up, so many ways to get trained and to become a professional, everywhere from the fundraising school courses to the doctoral program that was just developing as I left full-time work at the fundraising school, at the School of Philanthropy. And uh, I think that has been one of the most important things because we need to have credibility in order to attract the right donors. And another thing that I remember from those times is really getting into the topic of how do you make a case? We're not beggars. We are professional people who serve needs. And how do we make a case to whom, what tools do we use, and some of the issues that emerged certainly after I joined the fundraising school were the matter of accountability, sustainability, transparency. And I think since that time, we have put measures into place that help those professional aspects blossom. And that has come through evidence-based instruction through our courses uh, to know that folks can rely and have confidence in uh, the research base of what the fundraising school teaches. Lilia, you bring so much to the table, including your international perspective, Uh, a native of Europe, Estonia, as I recall. uh, And last time I spoke with you, I think you had over 90 countries stamping your passport throughout the years, maybe 100. It's a big number. 101. You, 101 now. Thank you very much. Can you talk about how you have seen fundraising grow, change, evolve internationally? And, and I will share with our audience, you know, some of Hank's original writings talked about fundraising being uniquely American. We respectfully took that out of Achieving Excellence in Fundraising this year uh, because of what we've seen in the growth internationally. You've been to these 101 countries plus the United States. How have you seen fundraising grow around the world? Well, that had a very personal aspect for me. 
because I happened to be so fortunate to be at the fundraising school when the Soviet Union broke up. And of course, there were so many countries from the former Soviet Union who wanted to know, how do we do it? And this is where the American model did serve us well. And people did look to the United States, how do they do it successfully? How have they done it for a couple of centuries and built their country? And so this was one of the true joys uh, being part of the fundraising school because I was sent to so many countries as they wanted to know how to learn, how to build on what was going on. In many countries, as you know, cultural and religious influences are very important for generosity, but how do we formalize it? And this was one of the things that uh, was such a joy for me. In fact, in 1996, I served uh, several months in my own country trying to build up the nonprofit sector and understanding of that sector. Estonians are very independent people and they had to learn how do we help others now that there's so many great needs that, that the Soviet Union finally left us. I also was sent to South America to several countries and we had an affiliate in Argentina. Uh, when we quit being refugees, finally got to America, then we were sent to South America by my father's church to establish a university. So because I was fluent and fluent in Spanish, it was such a pleasure to work in many of those countries, Spanish-speaking countries. And of course, we had an affiliate there in Mexico City, too. So the word about fundraising and what it can do for civil society, for individual as well as community development, was really a pleasure. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I have always found interesting is that how you make a case, how you find donors, how do you speak to your donors, those basic principles that are researched and experience-based that the fundraising school teaches are adaptable. It's not just the American way. And fortunately, I didn't run into a lot of resistance. There are times when people in some countries said, oh, that's just the way Americans do it. And I could point to some neighboring countries or organizations and say, look, these are the principles, they're proven. You can find that proof, but now you need to use your intelligence to see how it fits your culture, your type of situation, like in Estonia, post-communist, very independent people, how do they begin to develop more community? And those kinds of adaptations to different countries that probably was both one of my greatest challenges as well as my greatest rewards to see people grasp those principles and make a difference. And you have been uniquely situated to do that with your own personal story, your own professional expertise, uh, and your ability to travel around the world. Another area where you have been on the forefront is in the area of diversity and philanthropy. In fact, that's the topic of your AFP award-winning book, Diversity and Philanthropy. Um, and of course, there's been this wonderful resurgence in the never-ending quest in diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, as it relates to philanthropic leadership in terms of inclusion of donors, a broad understanding of philanthropy, not just uh, you know financial charitable giving, but many different ways people can be active philanthropically. Um, you know, and Lily, you were talking about this even before this, again, resurgence that we've seen in the last four or five years around this very important topic. What have you seen in terms of diversity as it relates to here in the United States and your work around the world in fundraising becoming more inclusive as time has gone along? I think one of the things, because I grew up uh, in Hispanic cultures, I mean, how many Estonians do you really know? Uh, outside of Estonia. And uh, one of the things that early on I noticed, and this really was what sparked my interest in the topic, was how much generosity took place, but was largely unrecognized, often unrecorded. And I think that over time, we became more aware of how people 
give differently in different ways and different preferences. Although I have to repeat the making a case and all those good principles still remain. Sometimes they're intuitive. Sometimes they're good common sense. But one of the major things that the fundraising school does is put a stamp of legitimacy on those principles, which I very much appreciate because as you know, I worked a lot with the curricula. Then as we saw interests grow, there were organizations that popped up. For example, Hispanics in Philanthropy. And there was is a group, uh, Asian Americans in Philanthropy. There is a group of uh, African American Foundation executives. And I, I'm not saying the exact right titles. Those are, were the purposes of those organizations. And as this awareness grew, at the same time, there was more growth among new immigrants versus those who had been here a while and some of the differences in giving. What did they prefer to give to? Was it community building? Was it specific topics like abuse? And that was one of the very interesting things that grabbed my attention from the very beginning in the early 90s. And it was very, very exciting to involve other people in that because there was so much generosity taking place that we did not officially recognize. It was one of my many rewards of being associated with the fundraising school and becoming global. And that's a book we still rely on heavily in our curriculum at the fundraising school anytime we raise that important topic of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, whether that's the leading of the nonprofit organization and our hiring and our management practices, and of course, diversifying our donor databases. You know, another one of your books, Lilia, that we rely heavily on is your book on leading up and using transformational leadership as fundraisers. And you have always been a strong advocate and encourager of us in professional fundraising to see ourselves as leaders, even though we rarely, if ever, hold that top seat in the organization. We're not the CEO, we're not on the board, or, or we're not the board chair. Can you just share your wisdom and guidance and advice to help fundraisers see themselves, not just as professionals, but also as leaders? Sometimes I think it's partly up to us it starts with how we view ourselves and therefore how we project a professionalism, even how we talk about fundraising. I think that has, of course, as I mentioned earlier, with the development of professionalism and acceptance of that, like certification, our, <clears throat> excuse me, certification and the conferences that we hold that we have significant luminaries come and present and be examples. But I think that uh, we can recognize that leadership comes from several levels because that means that we're not dependent on titles, on what kind of office we have, but it depends on characteristics. And I think some of it actually does start with self-respect and really believing in what we do. We make a huge difference. And some groups and uh, population groups, as well as organizations that I have worked with, that think that it's a form of begging. You know how much I like cartoons. And I have a, quite a number of cartoons that talk about the beggar. Well, I don't think we have that image too much anymore, and yet we all recognize that there are organizations and people that unfortunately are ripoffs, to use a colloquial term. And this is where we can practice that leadership and showing how do we do it well? What's the purpose of doing it? It's not just about the money. It's about the cause that's going to have a result, and we need money to bring out that result. So I think just in a very short couple of sentences, that is the bottom line of my commitment to that topic. Lilia, we are so fortunate to have your wisdom and your guidance as you offer advice now to fundraisers. Again, reiterating that there are those constants about the mission of the organization and making your case and building a relationship with the donor and stewarding that relationship over time. 
what advice do you have for fundraisers today with you know what the opportunities we have through say social media and all of the technology you know some of the things we see in our societies around the world right with uh, you know hopefully some community building but some polarization as well uh, that that can lead to some fracturing what advice do you have for fundraisers moving forward uh, based on what you've seen in the growth of fundraising over these last several decades I think we need to be wise consumers of professional development, of what's out there. There is so much going on compared to my early years with the fundraising school in the early 90s when there wasn't much competition. Now, if you get on LinkedIn, uh, just about every other course, it depends on your contacts, I know. But it seems like there is so much being offered. And what worries me is that some of these are false promises. I think that the true professional, and that kind of comes full circle, we talked about being professionals, we talked about being leaders, is going to look at standards in training that it isn't just a flash in the pan. It isn't something that's feel good. What is solid training? And of course, you know, my it's not a hidden agenda. The fundraising school does represent that because it is based on research and experience. It isn't just, here's what we think you ought to do. Here's 10 easy lessons. There is no such thing. And I do want to interject at this point that I'm deeply grateful for the several thousand probably people that have been in my courses, my seminars, my speeches, et cetera, et cetera. Because while I had the joy of helping you get a good experience, I also always learned. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you out there who made that a rich life experience. So thank you. Well, Lillian, I can tell you, as my colleagues and I work in the fundraising school, we endeavor to do so in a way that honors you and your work and your legacy and your colleagues who were alongside you in those earliest days when the fundraising school joined Indiana University back in 1988 and the school now enjoying the fundraising school now enjoying its 50th anniversary. The first course offered in June of 1974. We now have 24 courses that lead to four different certificates, and we can tailor make courses just for your nonprofit, just for your association, just for your region. Sometimes uh, a community foundation will bring us in to teach all of the nonprofits in their particular county or their particular region. We can do this in person. We can do this online uh, in the United States, anywhere around the world. And of course, we also have these weekly podcasts, the quarterly webinars, and our seminal textbook, Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, now in the book's fifth edition. All of this is available on our website at go.iu.edu forward slash TFRS for the fundraising school. Go.iu.edu forward slash TFRS. And Lilia Wagner, one of my very first instructors in fundraising, what an honor to have you back with us on the first day podcast from the fundraising school. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a real privilege and honor, and I wish you the best for the next 50 years. Thank you, Lilia. Same here as we say in the Polish, Stolat. I don't know if you say that in Estonia, Stolat, may you live 100 years uh, as a way to say to be vibrant throughout your life. And our producers today, Jennifer Boffman and Mike Anthony, I'm Bill Stanjakevich. You are now more fully informed on this first day from the fundraising school.